Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Precision Clocks for Resilient Timing in GNSS Denied Environments, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Microchip. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that this webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. I'm Mackenzie Shoemaker, content marketing producer for GPS World, and I will be your moderator for today's event. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel at the left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, type it in the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue and producer Aurora Harris or I will personally assist you. You may learn more about the speakers by viewing their bio, photo, and email address in the panel located on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget you'll see in the bottom left corner of the screen. Finally, at the bottom right corner of the console, you will find a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download and a link to visit the microchip webinar. Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. First, we will be hearing from David Chandler, Product Line Manager for the Frequency and Time Systems Business Unit at Microchip Technology. We will also be hearing from David Bale, Director of Microchips Vectron Oscill Accelerator Products, which is part of the Microchip Timing and Communication Group, as well as from Stuart Hampton, Product Line Manager for the Frequency and Time Systems FTS Business Unit at Microchip Technology. He brings a background in defense applications, medical devices, and telecommunications. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you, David Chandler. David, take it away. Great, thank you, Mackenzie. So I'm gonna start off the presentation covering some general topics, and then we'll get into specific applications and solutions after that initial discussion. The first topic I want to cover is Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS. This is GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Beidou, IRNSS, QZSS. There's a lot of different satellite constellations out there. We tend to think of them as position and navigation constellations and tools, but really at the heart of it, they are precision time networks. Each one of those satellites up there has an atomic clock that's synchronized to ground stations uh, that are delivering UTC to those satellites. And when we have precise time up at those satellites, as they transmit signals to a receiver on the surface of the earth, we can figure out our position and also our local time by the transit time it took to get from the satellites to those receivers. So if I zoom in and look at four of those satellites, um, in order to get local time and my position, which would be X, Y, and Z, that's a total of four variables, I need at least four satellites to be able to determine that. So I have four unknowns with four satellites, I have four transit times, I have the almanac, almanac information, and doing some simple math, I can get that information from here. I also have the benefit of getting the precision frequencies that are sent from those uh, satellites as well. So for GPS, I have the L1, the L2, the L5 band, and for other satellite constellations, I have similar GNSS bands available. So now that I have that time and frequency available, it's ubiquitously used across the world. Um, the top row of images here show you some military applications, there's a phase array radar, uh, military radio, tactical missiles. Uh, also, there's a lot of industrial applications for the frequency and time. We use it in a power grid. We use it for farming equipment. We use it in industrial process controls. 
In the enterprise world, it's used in data centers. Um, and for our cell phones, we use it uh, on a regular basis, both the time and frequency. And finally, the application we're most used to, the, uh, you know, the consumer navigation is also shown here. So I'm gonna cover two specific applications that require the frequency and the time. Um, the first one I'm going to cover is by static, uh, by static radar. I'm going to focus on frequency here and why it's important to have uh, syntonized frequencies. By the way, when you're talking about frequency, when they match, it's syntonization as opposed to synchronization, which is time. So in the case of a by static radar, you have two different uh, satellite dishes out here, two different radar stations. One's transmitting. The other one is going to receive the signal. And the transmitted signal will bounce off of a, you know, in this case, a drone, and then it'll bounce off and be received at a, the uh, receiver, which is at a different location. When it is bounced off and received at the receiver, it actually changes frequency, uh, changes frequency because of the Doppler effect. And the key thing here is the slower that target is moving, the harder it is to differentiate it from the background. So the real key is that you wanna be able to differentiate very, very small frequencies. In order to be able to differentiate very small frequencies, what you have to do is have reference frequencies that are very well matched at both the transmitter and receiver. The better the reference frequency is matched, the better we can tell those small changes in frequency. So that was for a slow moving target. I'm going to look at the opposite problem right now, which is for a fast moving target. And in this case, I'm going to focus on time synchronization. In the last slide, I showed you a bi-static radar. In this case, I'm gonna show you multiple monostatic radars. And these multiple monostatic radars have um, transmit and receive at different locations. I'm oh, sorry, at the same location. Um, could somebody mute themselves? Thank you. Um, anyway, the transmit and receive occurs at the same satellite dish in this case, or at the same radar. So it's sent out to the target and it bounces back. Um, and, you know, we can get the position, the velocity, different things like that. But in this case, we have multiple uh, monostatic radars. And what they're doing is they're sending their radar pictures to one consolidated, integrated radar picture. And in order to prevent high-speed uh, targets from appearing as multiple traces on the radar screen, you actually need to have a very precise time. Otherwise, they're going to show up as multiple different traces which can cause confusion in a battlefield environment. So this is an example of why precise time is so important. If I have precise time at those two radar locations, I can integrate them well. Right, so we're using frequency and time. I just gave you two applications. Why do we worry about backups? Well, the reason we worry about backups is because problems can occur with those signals. A solar flare will block a GNSS signal. Uh, spoofing and jamming. If you're working in a hostile theater, people could be jamming or spoofing, which is essentially giving you a, a, the wrong information on a GNSS signal. So you need to be able to detect that and stop it from getting to your system. Um, if you look at the bottom picture, here's an example of an urban canyon. It's very hard to see four satellites when all you have is a little tiny view of the sky available. Um, also, you might have reflected signals that are also causing problems. And then the two images in the middle, uh, you know, covering tunnels, underwater, inside buildings. Unfortunately, the GNSS signals are fairly weak. Um, and so there are times where they just can't be received. And while there's lots of different things other than GNSS that are used today, the first line of defense uh, for some of these is backups. The first line of defense is your local oscillator. The local oscillator was trained to the specific GNSS frequency and time while it was available. And then when it disappears, the local oscillator does its interpretation of, you know, what that would have done while it was, uh, while it's in holdover. So when we talk about local oscillators, microchip technologies has three different unique technologies we use to make oscillators. On the left, you see our silicon solutions here, uh, 555 timers, but also we make MEMS oscillators. Uh, we make quartz crystal oscillators, and we also make atomic clock oscillators. So we're the only company in the world that has all three of these technologies in one shop.
This chart shows the different types of oscillators uh, if I, uh, and their daily fractional frequency drift. So how much does frequency move on a regular basis when there's no GNSS to sync them to? On the far left, you see Ma uh, MEMS oscillator, which is a silicon solution. And it's holding about one E to the minus seven frequency uh, drift per day. What does one E to the minus seven mean? Well, for a 10 megahertz oscillator, that means it would drift about one hertz a day. I go from my MEMS oscillators to my quartz oscillators, and now I start moving from 1e to the minus 7 to about 1e to the minus 10. 1e to the minus 10 corresponds to uh, 1 millihertz gigahertz oscillator. And then after my crystal oscillators, my atomic clocks pick up. I go from things like my chip scale atomic clock all the way over here to my cesium beam tube references. Now, cesium beam tomb references are a primary st reference standard, and so they don't actually have any deterministic uh, drift on a daily basis. There is noise in it, but there's no actual deterministic value that you would see in terms of frequency variation. As oscillator manufacturers and clock manufacturers, we tend to talk in the frequency world. Problem is a lot of holdover applications actually require time holdover or phase holdover. So the question often is, well, how do I take that frequency converted into time? Well, phase, frequency, and then the drift or the aging are related by a second order differential equation. I have an integral form of it shown here, and you can see there's really three main contributing factors. The first is the aging. That's another word for the fractional frequency drift we just talked about before and initialization events. And what you see is as holdover goes on, this will actually wind up causing a drift in time that is a quadratic, so it'll go up as a square of the time that you're in holdover. The next term is your environmental terms. So this is any changes due to temperature, pressure, orientation, acceleration. These are things, uh, all these environmental things, they have to be integrated as any frequency changes occurred over time to see the phase error. And the last term here is really my noise, error, uh, noise term. This is anything related to random noise, disciplining error, Problem, uh, or things that were introduced in the manufacturing process at the oscillator. These can all introduce this error term right here. Um, so there's a really the three different areas you need to concentrate on when you want to improve holdover. So this is the same chart as I showed two slides ago, um, but now instead of showing the daily average frequency, I'm actually drift, I'm showing the daily time drift. Now on this chart, what I do want to say is that I only looked at the deterministic aging and the noise component, not the environmental one in the middle. And what you can see is a silicon solution off here to the left, the MEM solution. It's holding about 1 e to the minus 2 seconds, or 10 milliseconds. The quartz then goes from about 10 milliseconds over to about 1 microseconds uh, in a day. And then I pick up my atomic clocks where they go from about 1 microsecond to about 100 picoseconds per day. Uh, one thing you may notice is that the last two products here, are cesium beam tube reference and hydrogen mesh, are actually shifted positions. That's because the cesium actually has a larger noise content. And so when I look at it in a time domain, it swaps places with the hydrogen maser, which is the quietest commercial clock available in terms of noise. So what solution is best for time and frequency? Well, this really depends on your application, right? What is your frequency and time budget? Are you trying to hold a hertz? Are you trying to hold a millihertz, a millisecond, a second? Right, so you need to figure that out. How long will I be in holdover? Um, you know, if that's another thing I have to worry. Am I worried about just a couple of minutes or am I worried about months in a GNSS environment? Will the unit constantly be turned on and off during the mission? Some of the devices we're gonna to show today actually have an initialization error that have to be put in there as well. Um, Will the unit operate in a controlled environment? If it's sitting in a data center, for example, it's going to be very well controlled. If I'm a radio in a backpack and a soldier who's jumping out of an airplane, I'm going to get some pretty big environmental changes. So it needs to be able to operate in that. Power, am I going to plug it into a wall or will it be on a battery? Um, size and weight limitations. Go back to the radio again. If it's a 200 pound solution, that soldier is not going to be ha happy that it's in his backpack. Um, will it be static or mobile? That can affect some of the solutions that we're going to present today. Um, also, does it need to be ruggedized? Um, when that soldier jumps out of the plane and he lands on the ground, even though he has a parachute, he absorbs a pretty good shock. I can tell you that out of experience. And he certainly wants to make sure that when he does, his radio is still working. 
Then the last thing is a financial budget um, that you need to worry about. So we put these together in an acronym called SWAPC, size, weight, and power, and cost. Um, there could be other letters in this acronym as well, environment, other ones as well. That's just the acronym we choose. So with that, I'll hand it back to Mackenzie. Mackenzie? Thank you, David. That was great. Next, we will be hearing from David Bale, Director of Microchip's Vectron Oscillator Products, which is part of the Microchip Timing and Communications Group. Off to you, David. All right. Thanks, Mackenzie. Oh, okay. So uh, Dave gave you the overview of uh, the, GNS, the GNSS and the stability requirements and talked a lot a bit about the, the different quality of oscillators uh, that you have within the uh, GNSS modules. I'm going to get a little bit into GNSS modules, but I'm going to focus on the quartz solution. <clears throat> excuse me, focus on the quartz solution and some of the uh, quartz products. So I'd like to start with a, uh, a block diagram of a, of a GNSS module. If we look at the block diagram, it's basically uh, comprised the, the antennas coming in with the GNSS signal. For our GNSS modules, we have the receiver on board. The signals received, which generates the, uh, the pr precise time from that. Depending on customers' needs, we can provide a multitude of different outputs, one PPS or programmable outputs or various RF frequencies, sine wave, logic uh, waveforms, all depends. And also, the, the main contributor to the holdover, as Dave was mentioning, is going to be the, the stability of the oscillator. And depending on the needs, we can offer anything from, from TCXOs, to the, which would be at the lower end of the stability spectrum up to atomic standards. And, and I'll cover some of the uh, stabilities for the quartz-based oscillators, and Stuart and Dave will get into uh, uh, some of the higher stability uh, atomic standards. So this is the uh, this is the same chart that uh, that D that Dave just showed for for different uh, type stabilities and holdovers for for products. Um, and if you if you look at this uh, chart here, this is basically a uh, uh, looking at the holdover as a function of the length of time that you go into holdover. That if you lose the GPS signal and uh, or GNSS signal and you switch over to the local oscillator for timing, depending on the oscillator that you choose. And that's what these different lines represent as different oscillators. And over here uh, would be some of the looser stability TCXOs and MCXOs, and we'll get into those, and some of our higher stability OCXOs. And then our, our uh, atomic standards will hold uh, a bit longer for, uh, for holdover to keep you whatever your requirement is. And we're highlighting here 1.5 microseconds because that's been a, a standard that's in the industry for a lot of the uh, wireless communications as a requirement. So we'll go through and, and determine uh, and discuss some of the parameters that, that causes why some oscillators are better than others as far as, as holdover. When we look at uh, the GNSS modules, as I, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's many different oscillators that can be used. And so if we look at here, like the, the first solution is a TCXO, you can see the holdover is pretty loose at uh, one millisecond actually instead of microseconds for a uh, for a 24 hour period and then so the best we can really do with quartz is about 1.5 microseconds so various oscillators and these are all going to have an impact as well on what dave talked about the the swap c the size weight and power and the cost as well and as you can see in the the far right column the sizes can vary from uh uh you know less than an inch by inch to you know two inches by or by two inches by two inches and the phase noise can vary as well. So depending upon your requirements that the customer is looking for, we have to we have to look at the multitude of different oscillators that we can marry with the GPS receiver to come up with the uh, with the best solution. Next, we have uh, what we call pulse per second or PPS modules. Same block diagram that we looked at for the GNSS modules, but sometimes. Uh, there may be a one PPS or already a GPS uh, receiver somewhere in, uh, in the customer system. So instead of duplicating that within the module, we can take the input of just a, a one PPS signal or a stable RF signal and use that as the reference into the oscillator and discipline our reference oscillator based off that input signal. If that PPS signal disappears or it's deemed to be unstable, uh, at that point, we can switch over to hold over to the local oscillator, and the rest of the circuit will behave just like the uh, the GNSS receiver that we were that we were just reviewing. The, the main difference here is the GNSS receiver uh, is not is not included here. It just it's using a uh, 
PPS signal that already exists in the in the system. And just like what we were showing before, a few different models. We have uh, various models. They just don't have the the, uh, the the GPS receiver on board. They they take the the PPS signal in or a frequency in. But again, multiple sizes and multiple stabilities based on the requirements. We're not going to go through the the details of the uh, of the different models here, but just to really let you know that that both exist with GPS receivers and without GPS receivers, depending on the system that is being married with. So you saw this equation from Dave, where you have to look at the, the aging, the temperature, the noise factors and things, and all that adds together to, to create the holdover and the performance. Well, oven controlled crystal oscillators, which is what an OCXO is, those are the best oscillators, quartz based oscillators, I should say. And I, I wanna repeat that I'm focusing on quartz. The atomic standards will have uh, better stability, but when we look amongst the, the family of quartz based oscillators, oven controlled crystal oscillators, give you the best holdover. They minimize the aging temperature and noise effects versus uh, other oscillators. Why is an OCXO the best quartz-based oscillator for holdover? Uh, it has a very proportional, uh, very, very well st stable proportional oven controller. There's many components that are temperature sensitive, including the crystal as well as some of the other components. And you can see there in, in red in the, in the center of the block diagram, we try to take those uh, temperature sensitive components and heat them at a stable temperature. So as the ambient temperature is varying, our temperature sensitive components, including the crystal, stay at a very uh, fixed frequency of just, uh, in some cases, just a few milli-degrees. Uh, we also design the circuit for low noise. Uh, we need to make sure that the noise contributions are minimized from the circuitry. So we look at things like the voltage regulator, the output stage, the, the amplifiers and things like that to make sure it's designed for low noise. But the third and probably most important contributor for this type of oscillator versus other quartz-based oscillators like TCXOs or just XOs is going to be the, the uh, very, very high Q SC cut quartz crystal that we use. It has uh, very, very high Q, so very low noise content and very low aging. And, and that's the contributor to the main contributor to the OCXO performance for, for good holdover. <laughs> When you, when you look here, there are many different uh, OCXO products, and this, these five are just a small sampling of, of the OCXO products. Uh, what I really wanted to highlight here are some of the technologies that, that go into some of the OCXO products. The first two products there, uh, they're subpar per billion over the industrial temperature range, so very good for temperature stability. And they're conventional OCXOs. Just like I said, we're heating uh, all the sensitive electronics at a, at a fixed frequency. But if we look at the next two down, the MX041, the MX060, these are what we call our microprocessor corrected OCXOs. We take a conventional OCXO, we add a microprocessor and a temperature sensor to it, and we can do further correction and do a secondary correction over temperature with the devices, and we can further improve the frequency versus temperature stability. But you can see these products tend to be actually a little bit larger than the other products. Um, and the last product down here is we, we, it's taking our MX product and going one step further. Uh, it's allowing our customers access to the internal temperature sensor and the frequency versus temperature coefficients and allows our customer to actually calibrate or compensate within their system, not just within the factory before it ships. And they can either compensate it by steering the frequency or they can just calculate what the accumulated phase error would be from the temperature variations and then via software eliminate those, uh, those variations. So it gives more flexibility to the customer with, with some of these type products. So if we go back to this curve and look at all the, the family of oscillators, what I just described here is, is circled in, uh, in black. So these are some of the, the better performing uh, OCXOs. And if you focus on the uh, 1.5 microsecond line, you can see for OCXOs, somewhere between 10 to 24 hours is the range uh, that you'll be able to hold 1.5 microseconds of, uh, of holdover with an OCXO. Next, we'll move to the uh, EMXO, or Evacuated Miniature Crystal Oscillator. This is basically an OCXO, but we evacuate the entire package, and that, that vacuum is what creates the thermal isolation and reduces the power of the oscillator. Um, so because we're, we're in a vacuum and reduced, uh, you know, improved thermal isolation, uh, the power is about 75 to 80% lower than a conventional OCXO, and it starts up in about one fifth the time that a conventional OCXO starts up. So, and it's also smaller in size due, due to uh, the crystal being an open blank versus a sealed package. 
Um, so you have those benefits, but the major drawback to the MXO is you get frequency versus temperature stability uh, that's, that's not as good as an OCXO. It, it can be 10 to 20 times or even 30 times worse than an OCXO for the frequency versus temperature stability. So this is really an application. If, if you need small size, fast warm up or low power and the stability somewhere in between an OCXO and a TCXO, you're, you're really looking at the EMXO and that's where that product would fit. So again, if we go back to the family of holdover curves, you can see it's right here. It's what it's another set of uh, lineup here, and I've circled uh, uh, the EMXO. So at about 1.5 microseconds, you can you can maintain uh, if about two hours. You can stay within 1.5 microseconds with an EMXO. And lastly, from the uh, from the oscillators, just to touch on, is a microprocessor corrected TCXO or our MCXO products. And instead of an OCXO, this is starting with a TCXO. Um, and doing the second level compensation, just like I described for the OCXOs. The advantage here is the power consumption. You have TCXO power consumption. So as you can see here, about 20 milliamps versus maybe uh, uh, you know, an amp turn on for, for an OCXO. So it is um, much lower in, uh, in power consumption, uh, but you're gonna give up on the overall stability. You're hitting EMXO type stabilities at the 30 to 50 part per billion, uh, but you're, you're uh, um, you're, you're, and you're hitting the power, but you're not getting OCXO performance with a uh, with a product like this. So if we go back to the curve again, at, you know, 1.5 microseconds, we probably can hold that for about one hour with our uh, MX503 product. So uh, Dave talked a little bit about uh, noise and the noise effects. So looking at the same equation that, that Dave showed again, but focusing just on the noise factors, and there's two different types of noise factor that, that can impact an oscillator. And there's random noise, but there, there can be deterministic noise. Um, and the random noise, there's no way we can compensate random noise due to the random nature. But if it's deterministic noise, we, we can either prevent it or, or compensate for it. Um, and that's really what, we, uh, what I wanna focus on here. So there's, there's basically three different ways that we can compensate for vibration. Vibration is uh, the most significant um, deterministic noise that, that gets induced into an oscillator. As an oscillator vibrates, that vibration gets uh, induced into uh, and, and degrades the phase noise at that vibration frequency. So what can we do to improve it? Well, there's three different methods. The first one is, is passive isolation, and that's using either internal or external uh, shock mounts and that's to avoid the vibration from getting to uh, the sensitive quartz structure within, within the unit. Um, the uh, disadvantage of passive I isolation is it's really good at just higher frequencies. At lower frequencies, uh, you don't have the dampening effect. And actually, you can have an uh, amplification of the uh, vibration uh, at the resonance of, of the shock absorbers. But for higher frequency vibration, it works really well. Um, a second method is dual crystal cancellation. So a crystal has a vector associated with the vibration sensitivity of it. If you can take two crystals and orientate them 180 degrees uh, for, with uh, canceling their, uh, their, their uh, vibration vectors, vibration sensitivity vectors, when you put that together as one oscillator, you've canceled out the vibration effect. So, so dual crystal cancellation is... Uh, is very popular and it's also can be with some of the strip and very small form factor crystals we can get that as small as uh, five by seven millimeters for some of our tcxos with dual crystal and the last one is active cancellation uh what this is doing it's using a uh, an accelerometer and we're measuring the magnitude and frequency of the vibration uh and direction of the vibration and we're compensating for it we're adjusting the frequency before it can be affected by uh the frequent by the, the vibration frequency um and steering the frequency. So because of this feedback mechanism, we're limited to just uh, lower frequencies. As the frequency gets high enough, the feedback is not quick enough to cancel that out. So for lower frequencies, active cancellation works very well. This is very similar to noise cancellation he headphones, uh, same, very similar technology uh, as that. And just to show a, a graph of uh, active cancellation and how it works. So if you look at the, the, the red line, say that's the, uh, the customer spec, the light blue line that you see there would be the phase noise under vibration for this particular example. And we can see at several points, it's out of spec and above the line for the, for the red line customer spec. We turn on the active cancellation and you can see below about a thousand hertz, a significant improvement 
in the blue line for the phase noise under vibration. And beyond about 1,000 hertz, the two lines pretty much overlap, and you're, you're beyond the feedback loop of, the, uh, of compensating out the, uh, the vibration frequency. So this one's tuned to right about 1,000 hertz where we see improvement. But you can see it's pretty significant. And you know it can be uh, you know 10, 20, 30 dB depending on the G sensitivity and the, uh, um, the 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 magnitude of the frequency as as far as the correction that you can see. So with that, um, you know, Dave showed you this chart of, of the different uh, core, uh, different oscillators. Uh, the ones highlighted here in a square box, those are the quartz-based items that I focused on. And, and uh, Dave and Stuart are going to talk to you more about the uh, the atomic clocks. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for your time, and I will turn this back over to Mackenzie. Thank you, David. Our next speaker for today's webinar is Stuart Hampton, Product Line Manager for the Frequency and Time Systems Business Unit at Microchip Technology. He brings a background in defense applications, medical devices, and telecommunications. Stuart, take it away. Thank you very much, Mackenzie, and hi, everybody. That was great information from Dave and Dave there. And uh, I wanted to sort of uh, build upon that and talk about a different type of oscillator that is similar but different uh, to a coarse oscillator uh, called an embedded atomic clock. Now, the functionally, it does the same thing. It provides a frequency source, and it usually has a fairly low voltage requirements, the types of units that Dave was just talking about. But as you mentioned, they are more stable and that means it behaves differently from a, a crystal oscillator. It usually gets on frequency much, much more quickly in just a few minutes. And also there's a term called retrace, which means when you turn a unit on and off, the frequency and the aging rate of a crystal oscillator will be slightly different when you turn it back on. That's called retrace. Um, atomic clocks are less susceptible to that phenomenon. Also frequency jumps, are expected and normal in crystal oscillators and they need to be designed in and, and, and worked around. Again, atomic clocks don't suffer uh, to, uh, with that type of uh, scenario, so they are more stable. And then just drift, we saw different uh, estimations of drift over a day, which is a very useful way to decide how much drift you can tolerate during the type of application that you need to complete during that time period when you don't have any external reference. Um, I've got pictures of two atomic clocks there. I've got a CSAC, that's a chip scale atomic clock, and I have a MAC, that's a miniature atomic clock. Those are funny names, uh, but they're tiny little boxes for uh, that, that are atomic clocks, and they're designed to be placed on PCBA boards, soldered in, and put inside systems that do very mission critical, industrial, military, and scientific things that require high performance. Uh, the main difference between a CSAC on the top and the MAC and the bottom, CSAC is a cesium-based, super low power, 120 milliwatt design. And the MAC uses more power, it uses about six watts, but it is higher performance and it uh, uses the rubidium atom. They're both very, very good clocks, very stable uh, embedded atomic clocks. So the theme that we also are talking about here is resilience, and I want to talk about PNT resilience for just a minute. The way I look at PNT resilience is from three different areas, okay? So enhancements to GNSS. We know that the GS signal that we get is weak, it can be interfered with, and it can be jammed and spoof. There is an ongoing effort to enhance our GPS satellite constellation called GS3F, and they're going to make the, the signal stronger and less susceptible to jamming. And the main target for that benefit is obviously military users that are in challenging environments. And there's also the other end of that enhanced signal is, is the receivers. And there's effort to, to implement M code across the defense and user community so they can take advantage of these new signals. Um, separately from that is there is investment low earth orbit to mission navigation and timing network to augment GNSS and GPS. These are low swap satellites using as much as, po as possible commercial off the, self, off the shelf technology. And that way, uh, the idea is that you have many, many 
a small, if it has a problem, does not affect the performance of the overall network. And these satellites will talk to each other uh, using optical cross-linking, and many of them will require uh, embedded atomic clocks on each satellite in order to have their local time and also be able to retransmit that time information to other satellites in the constellation. The main focus I want to think about in this presentation is holdover. So atomic clocks are very often designed in for holdover, when you expect to have to run independent of an external clock and you're willing to make the investment to design in an embedded atomic clock. Uh, there are other types of devices, such as inertial measurement units, which, which through a different technology can let you know your, uh, your position when there's no external reference. Embedded atomic clocks let you know what time it is when there's no external reference with a definite trend toward low swap and cost control. Here I've read, uh, laid out an array of applications. There are many, many um, applications for these very versatile products, ranging from defense right through to scientific. I'll focus on two areas. One is defense. Clearly, uh, the need to have resilience to um, threats to GNSS and GPS is very high, so there are multiple solutions. Assured PNT is a, is a program that's being implemented by the DOD for vehicles, for soldiers, for all kinds of applications to give them resilience. Many of those programs use something called the chip scale atomic clock to get that local atomic accuracy um, without needing the external reference. Uh, another application uh, is, is AUVs, auto, um, autonomous underwater vehicles is a classic application where you have essentially an underwater drone that is deployed on missions to do intelligence gathering and, uh, and, and deep ocean exploration. They don't have access to GPS for weeks at a time and they're battery powered and there's no way to, to make any corrections in the clock or to recharge the batteries. So that's a classic application of an embedded atomic clock uh, that's low power, super high accuracy. And I'll talk about one more, which is an industrial application which illustrates the benefits of atomic clock is the ocean bottom seismic. There are um, uses uh, and ways to, to discover oil and gas uh, resources with less exploratory drilling in the way they do that is to, is to make an array of sensors and place them on the ocean bottom floor. Each of those sensors has an atomic clock on it, has a CSAC actually, and the sensors will, will shoot a sound wave into the bedrock and measure the return time of the echo. Because all these atomic clocks have been synchronized precisely, they can create a very precise map, 3D map, and, and know exactly where these reserves are so they can measure them and go after them if needed with Again, much less exploratory drilling. And there are a number of other scientific uses and also space uses for uh, low swap atomic clocks. So they all, those applications all sound very different and diverse and exciting. And, but they all have several common hard requirements, which is they're portable. They're very portable and they're all battery powered. They need to warm up quickly because they're switched on and switched off a lot. They're not plugged into the wall. They don't have a huge battery to, the, to uh, rely on. So they need to get to that frequency quickly. Uh, in the case of a CSAC, it gets the frequency in less than two minutes uh, uh, between minus 40 and plus 80 degrees Celsius. That's a really big deal uh, when you need to have something that's mission critical. Um, also, so because of the uh, the time error over a day, as David mentioned, of around a microsecond is a very good spec uh, to stay within. In the case of our Mac technology, it's, 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 it's even less than that. And then temperature swings affect all oscillators, but because we use atomic resonance in embedded atomic clocks, uh, we are much less affected by temperature swings than a, a traditional crystal oscillator, although the best OCXOs, as Dave mentioned, can overcome that temperature swing by having its own built-in oven. And I think this is critical for some of these embedded clocks is, is to have a one pulse per second discipline capability built in. Many of these applications, when they do have access to GNSSS, they want to discipline the oscillator so it's on perfect frequency and they use a built-in one pulse per second they can get from GNSS to do that. And in the case of microchip, our embedded atomic clocks all have that one pulse per 
second uh, circuit built in. So here's the, the math equation. And uh, when uh, my team said there would be no math, they lied. But we'll, we'll keep it interesting because the same idea happens here in atomic clocks as it does with crystal oscillators. You want to minimize the aging rate of the oscillator. You want to know how it's going to be affected by temperature. And you're going to want to uh, discipline the oscillator so that if you do lose the external reference, you'll go into holdover, but you'll be in the best possible position because you've been disciplining it right up until you lose that signal. So here are some illustrations of, of those three. One is the aging effect. So Dave mentioned a broad array, a broad portfolio of crystal oscillators that we have with all kinds of performance levels, every kind of crystal oscillator you could possibly want. So that gray area there is, is the time um, error over a three-day period uh, based on the, the aging spec on that, on that crystal oscillator going from less precise to more precise. And you see there's an overlap there. So a very good high-performance OCX, so it has a better aging band. The purple band there, which is a CSAC, uh, but it has obviously a, a, a swap uh, component as well. It's more power. And the green sliver down there is our MAC performance. That's our Rubidium performance. Because of its design, it, it's got a larger package with, with more technology in there. It's a super accurate atomic clock. It uses a little more power than the CSAC, but it, it beats all the OCXOs. Uh, if that's the kind of precision you need, then, then you go with the MAC. And if you don't need as much, but you still want atomic, uh, you go with the CSAC. So those are the trade-offs. Another interesting one is temperature. Again, in the real world where these devices are used, they're, they're being uh, moved around. They're being perhaps going from cold to hot to cold again. Here's an experiment we did with two CSACs and an oven control crystal oscillator. This was to simulate uh, a drone on a hot uh, airfield waiting to be deployed. It's, it's plus uh, 50 degrees Celsius. And then it gets deployed, it shoots up into the air, and it gets up to cold temperatures. We just went to minus 10. And we measured uh, the frequency error during those temperature extremes from hot to cold to hot to see how accurate the, the oscillator is during the extremes. And as you might expect, uh, on the oscillator, uh, the OCXO did have a bigger impact uh, based on temperature than the atomic clock. And that's one of the reasons that you want to get this spec called temperature coefficient. So when you look at your choices, if you need to be able to behave well across a wide temperature range that changes rapidly, you're going to want to look at temperature coefficient as one of your determining factors for what kind of oscillator you want to um, use. And then, as I mentioned, when you, are, uh, when you do have access to GNSS, why not use it? It's a free resource. So Many, many suppliers and uh, engineers put together a GNSS disciplined oscillator. This is one that we manufacture that has an atomic uh, CSAC on it. And the chart there illustrates the benefit of combining GNSS with an atomic oscillator. That blue dash line there, that's the, that's the uh, short-term stability of a GPS signal. The, the sh the, it, it gets better with time. Uh, if you look only over a short period of time, you may lose the signal. It may be unavailable. Uh, so that's not very uh, um, stable. But over time, the GPS signal is very, very stable. Uh, and, and so that's why it goes down to the right there. The green uh, curve there is the short-term stability of CSAC. As soon as you flick it on and it locks to the atoms, it's very, very stable. So that's that green curve. And then eventually the GPS signal will, will end up being more stable. Again, because GPS is coming from cesium and other high capacity, high performance atomic clocks. If you combine the two, you get that red curve there. You get the best of both worlds. You get the GNSS when you need it. You get the CSAC right away. And then you get the best of both worlds when you have that G uh, GNSS disciplined oscillator running. And then when you do lose a signal and when you are running in holdover, you've started at your perfect frequency. So I think this is my final example of holdover. This is another thing that involves temperature. And this is just CSAC to highlight because that happens to be the product that I know uh, the most about for right now. Here we did an experiment. We actually simulated the performance of 
three different types of CSAC. So there, that that gray bar is is the current, the, the SA45S, I call it legacy because we just announced a new product, but bear with me. That gray triangle there is what happens to the time error. And, and this was to calculate over a two and a half day period, how much time error you would expect to see from these three different types of CSAC. So what we did here is after 12 hours, after half a day, at steady temperature, we increased the temperature of the unit by 20 degrees Celsius. And then that gray uh, uh, bar there shows that after two and a half days, you accumulate about 50 microseconds of time error. Okay, that's not, not horrible, it is what it is. The new product we just released last week, the SA65 is a CSAC, it's pin compatible, it looks identical, but it's got a better inside you see those two specifications there, the Tempco and the frequency drift. The data sheet says the Tempco is, in, in, instead of being five e to the minus 10, it's now three e to the minus 10. How does, what does that mean in real life? Well, that, that brown arrow there points to the time error of the new SE65 over that same two and a half day period. And you see we've cut the, the time error um, in half because of that in, uh, improved temperature coefficient. So that's why you care about temperature coefficient. And then the bottom one um, is, is actual performance. So we took a sample of these new SC65s and we actually put them through uh, these temperature swings in ovens, we collected data and actual uh, temperature coefficient is at closer to one E to the minus 10. Uh, and the frequency drift even was, was better than the nine that we spec on the data sheet, it's three. So, this is illustrative, and you can see that time delay was about 10 microseconds over two and a half day period for that actual data from our new SE65 product. So that's how those specs impact the real world. So just to summarize here, this, this whole presentation is really all about trade-offs and, and swap C, and what do you really need for your application? And uh, I've listed three atomic clocks here in this blue, um, table here, the CSAC and the MAC, I mentioned the microchip products. I've also mentioned an alternative uh, atomic clock product. What you want to look at when you choose your embedded atomic clock for your design is the monthly drift that we talk about, that spec, uh, the temperature coefficient, the tempco that you, that you want so that you can predict what's going to happen over your temperature range, and then you want to look at your expected temperature range. How hot and how cold is that unit going to get when you put it in your system? Make sure it can, your, your oscillator can handle that. And then what's not listed here is, is what I mentioned earlier, is you want to have that one pulse per second feature because you can rely on that to discipline your oscillator from a GNSS receiver. And so when you make your selection, you should definitely look for that type of functionality built in which means that you won't have to develop it yourself um, when you get going. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dave Chandler. Dave, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about our atomic system clock. Um, the uh, We have two atomic system clocks. They are our uh, cesium references and our hydrogen masers. And the cesium reference is used basically to define the unit second, the SI unit second. Now, commercial available cesiums, uh, do have some inaccuracies due to things like vacuum levels, environmental considerations, and also, um, you know, the fact that we don't have infinite interrogation times, but they're still very stable. And then our hydrogen masers, while they do have a little bit of deterministic long-term drift, if you look at the short-term variation, they're the best commercially available clocks available right now. These clocks are typically reserved for strategic assets, things like naval surface vessels or submarines or military operation centers. Um, 
we provide one microsecond of holdover for with these types of products for periods of weeks to months. So really a different level of stability we're talking about here. And in general, swap C is not your primary specification. This is really all about the time performance when you get to these. A hydrogen maser on the bottom left there costs about as much as most of our houses do. So as you can guess, we don't deploy them in an awful lot of places. So I talked about this difference between stability versus drift. I just wanted to emphasize that by showing you, I have a chart here and it's showing you cesium in blue and the uh, hydrogen in orange. And what you can see is at this scale, which is one e to the minus 14, you see the frequency of the cesium looks like it's moving around a lot. Now I do want to caution, this is a one e to the minus 14. If I put this on a scale with our quartz and our silicon parts, you wouldn't be able to see this variation. But at this scale, the cesium moves quite a bit more on a day-to-day -day basis than you see that the hydrogen maser does. So what is different though, is even though the hydrogen maser only moves a little bit day-to-day, -day, it has this deterministic long-term drift that winds up being about one e to the minus 16 per day, or two e to the minus 16. This is still incredibly small. To put that in perspective, that's 16 orders of magnitude we're talking about here. That's the ratio of the diameter of an atom to the length of the British Isles from the Shetland Islands down to um, Land's End over here. For those of you in the United States, this would be the same thing as saying the diameter of an atom to the length of the state of Texas. So real quickly, I'm not gonna focus too much on hydrogen masers because they're generally used for metrology purposes, but cesium is really used for holdover and strategic assets a lot. Uh, quickly, how does it work? We have a cell of cesium that gets heated up and we have atomic cesium coming out in this beam. And essentially there's an outer valence electrode uh, in each one of these cesium atoms and it's spinning either in one direction or another. We call that the up or the down direction. And it's a magnetic moment. So it is sensitive to a magnetic field. We use a magnetic field to sort out those two different possible states. And in this case, you see the up moments are the ones we're transmitting into our cesium beam tube. What happens in a cesium beam tube is we hit it with a very, very precise frequency. And when we hit it with that precise frequency, we actually change the up electrons to down electrons. Um, and the more precise we can get that frequency, the more blue or down electron atoms we're gonna have within the beam tube. At the end of it, uh, we have another magnet and then we have a signal detector. That signal detector, as we increase the number of blue atoms by fine-tuning the frequency tighter and tighter, actually winds up getting a stronger signal here. We use that as a feedback, and it tunes in the frequency to those great stabilities. So the two cesium standards we sell at Microchip, we offer the 5071A. This is really the industry gold standard. There's over 400 cesiums used by BIPM today to define UTC, which is the time we all see on the internet and the time we see on our uh, cell phones. 99.4 of those cesiums are 5071As for a microchip. So this is really you know, the industry gold standard without a doubt. We're gonna support this product at least through 2035. It has five e to the minus 13 frequency accuracy under all conditions, whether it's environmental, whether it's uh, you know aging, anything else over the lifetime, which is five years for high stability tube from 30 minutes after turn on. So you're guaranteed at this 5E to minus 13 level. Uh, we also offer our 4310B. Our 4310B is a more economical cesium beam tube and that handles one E to the minus 12. So factor of two worse in terms of stability. Um, and these products, when I'm talking the phase domain, the 5071 can offer sub 100 nanoseconds uh, holdover typical for months at a time. And for the 4310B, you look at sub 100 nanoseconds for weeks at a time. And this graph shows you the holdover performance, two different runs. Um, with the two different runs, what you're seeing here, the first run, we let it drift and then we re-steered it. The second one, we just let it keep running for 14 days or longer. What you can see is in both cases, we held about 40 nanoseconds over 14 days. Well, you can see from the red traces, it really didn't go very much as we continue to allow it to stay in holdover. Okay, so putting all the different technologies we talked about today, uh, this summary slide, 
uh, kind of shows you just some of the key specifications for each one of your local oscillators. Um, it shows the temp stability, the aging, the holdover, and you'll also see the swap information, the dimension, the power, and the cost. So you can see as we start with our silicon solutions, in general, you can see things like holdover, uh, you know, starts off at 2e to the minus 3, with uh, 2e to the minus 2, which is really good. And you move as you go across to the point where you get to the most stable oscillators over here on the right. As I mentioned, anytime there's performance improvement for the most part, we have this trade-off in size, weight, and power. Uh, though some of the products, particularly the CSEC that Stuart mentioned, actually has lower power. So it's kind of a paradigm shift within this chart. Okay, that's it. And back to Mackenzie. Thank you, everyone. That was great. At this time, we're going to jump into some questions we received during registration and a couple we got during the presentation. My first question is for Stuart. Can you talk on operation in remote areas as well as underground mining operations? Sure, thank you for that question. Yeah, so as I hinted at in my presentation, um, Lots of the applications for CSAC are military. Uh, there's one example that is classic, which is a very small aperture terminal. This is a transceiver used by our frontline forces in very hostile environments. It's, it's man portable, it's on a backpack. They set up and communicate and have to get on frequency in two minutes without any external time reference and, and uh, have encrypted gigahertz communications. They use the CSAC as their oscillator because it, it starts all quickly, it gets on frequency quickly, and they multiply it up, and they make their communications, and then they shut it all down again, and then they move away, and, and they do it again somewhere else. So that's a great example. Underwater mining, I think it's just like what I talked about, ocean bottom seismic. You're, you're in a deep hole, and you need an oscillator. You're probably battery powered. You may not have cabled power. You don't have GPS. Uh, um, GPS. And uh, we have we have applications for that as well, and, and clients looking at that application as well. Great question. Thank you, Stuart. Our next question is for Dave C. Dave, what do you think of the future availability of new GNSS technologies from emerging countries, and how to integrate them into existing methods? Hi, Mackenzie. Uh, good question. So you know there are lots of new GNSS satellite systems going up. Uh, IRNSS is an example of one. Beidou is an example of one. Uh, originally, we only had GPS, then GLONASS, and Galileo came along, and there's more on the way. Um, really, those are all excellent time sources. And basically, in terms of incorporating them, uh, you know, we just need to have receivers that accept the time basis from those. So it just comes down to incorporating your receivers, but the more GNSS constellations that are available, in general, as long as they're being precise, it's actually a boon because it gives you more sources, which means you're going to have more reliability in your time. Great. Okay. Next question is for Dave B. Is spoofing and jamming a real threat for civilian applications of GNSS? What are the GPS denied situations for civilian applications where your PNT can be employed? So uh, it, it absolutely uh, yeah, it is a threat. Um, I know it's 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 a good question because a lot of times I think we would think spoofing is is for military or things like that. Um, we've actually seen it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hackers out there that like hacking for the for the sake of hacking, uh, and we've seen uh, applications where um, timing for uh, digital video broadcast repeaters is was performed by GNSS receivers. Those can be uh, those can be jammed. So that's that's not a military application it's a communications uh, method. So that absolutely can happen. The the other thing, and this is um, uh, a bit ironic as well, is um, you see uh, w with uh, uh, Pokemon uh, Pokemon Go out there with people going around and doing that. There are people that were buying jammers off the internet just to make sure, you know, to spoof other people's GPS on their phone so they were going to the wrong location. Uh, and they could be doing things like that just as part of a game, but you could be driving in a car or doing something else and you're actually being affected by, by some of these uh, uh, spoofing signals that are that are out there. So uh, clearly not just the military. It's, we see much more focus in uh, emphasis from the military customers, but it can affect uh, many other uh, non-military applications. 
Great. All right. This next question is for Stuart. Someone asked, how can I learn more about low SWAP atomic clocks for my embedded design? Sure. Thank you for that question. So low swap was the theme of my talk for um, embedded atomic clocks. And the microchip uh, website is a great resource. Uh, you can go there and, and you can find out about the whole array of oscillators that we spoke about today. In particular, you can get data sheets. You can, you can actually get a, a dev kit if you want to try that my uh, CSAC and Mac products I mentioned. Get a dev kit, buy an oscillator. We have software. We have user guides and people can, can get started without having to do any soldering, any hardware design and they can play with the units very, very quickly. There's also lots of content out there. If you Google CSAC or if you Google microchip uh, Mac, lots of white papers uh, and lots of lots of information available freely uh, on the internet. And also they can contact me and I'll, I'll, I'll answer, uh, um, you know, answer your questions. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, this one is for Dave B, um, let's see, what are the most common oscillators used in the commercial aircraft GNSS receivers and what are the particular, and why, sorry, why that particular oscillator is used? Oh, okay, great. Um, so towards the uh, end of uh, my slides, I was talking about um, the effects of vibration on the uh, noise performance of oscillators. When we see uh, aircraft applications or any type of airborne applications, uh, typically the uh, vibration induced from the, uh, from the aircraft becomes a critical concern to the, to the performance and for the holdover. So within our uh, GNSS receivers that we're using for oscillators, we, the most common are gonna have some type of uh, vibration cancellation or isolation. Um, Couple common oscillators are TX707 or TX709, and that's a TCXO that I was showing. I had a block that or a uh, small sketch of, but it's a dual crystal where we mount a crystal on each side of the uh, ceramic substrate, to, so the crystals are in opposite orientation and cancel off. But we also have quite a bit, actually, uh, a majority of our uh, active cancellation opportunities are in land mobile, but also airborne. Uh, so, so quite a few airborne applications are for our active cancellation, and that could be our OXO43s or OXO47s or OXO48. They tend to be uh, much larger, and they're going to be bolted down type parts versus surface mount because from the vibration requirements, you need a, a pretty rigid package, and it needs to be well mounted to the to the chassis. Um, those are the most common for airborne applications. All righty. Thank you all for sharing these insights with us today. We're going to wrap up now, but first I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We appreciate your time. Before we wrap up, I'd like to go over a few closing remarks. Today's webinar was Precision Clocks for Resilient Timing in GNSS Denied Environments, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Microchip. If you have any additional questions for myself or our speakers, you can reach out to us directly via the email addresses you see on the slide. The resources panel houses a PDF of today's presentation slides, which you can download. To access this panel, click the green icon at the far right end of the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow and posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars. Upcoming webinars from GPS World will also be posted to this page. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you'll join us for another great webinar.